This is our extensive review of the Mercedes V-Class facelift. Different versions, different trims, different colors and also a lot of variety on the interior. This will be very interesting. Also with the Marco Polo, the travel van version. Everything of that here on Autogefühl, your number one resource for in-depth car reviews and your number one community to discuss cars. Today with Thomas in full HD, full screen and full length. Let's go! Taking a look at the front, all new Mercedes V-Class facelift versions look a little bit different here in the front grille. Also this lower graphic has been changed, looks a little bit sportier. This one here is the base version and also the avant-garde or exclusive. They also carry those two double fins. Soon I'll show you the differences. That's also an AMG line. And here the base version also comes with halogen headlamps. They look also a little bit different. I'll also soon show you the differences. And here now you can see that both avant-garde and exclusive line have this chrome accentuation in the lower part. And this vehicle here is also equipped with the optional LED lamps. So there's halogen, LED, and then the LED high beam, so three trims overall. And you see they have a different signature here in the front, which looks a little bit more modern and elegant. And it's really interesting, in the LED version, you can see the LED daytime running light is exactly here and that's also the illuminated part next to the LED headlamp unit, the main headlamp unit. So remember how it looks like here again and then the base halogen headlamp unit and here it is when it's off the same design right there but this line is then not the LED daytime running light it's just a normal light bulb in this unit right there. This is then at the moment the on daytime running light. And this is the AMG line with a diamond pin grille and also with just one horizontal fin right there. I think to me the most beautiful version and looks sportier. Then again with two chrome fins horizontal in the lower end. This also moves the V-Class more towards a passenger car styling. What do you think? AMG line here for the V-Class? Does it work? Yes or no? Tell us in the comments. Hey guys, I'm back here. So we parked them in the front here now, that they are in one line, but in the rear then you can see the three different lengths of the Mercedes V-Class. You could say small, mid-size and big, but they call it compact, large and extra large. And the interesting thing is the first two ones, they share the same wheelbase. The biggest one has an extra long wheelbase and the length is 4 meters 89 or 192 inches for the first one, 5 meters 14 or 202 inches for the middle one, and this one here 5 meters 37 or 211 inches. So depending on the purpose how much space for either cargo or passengers you need on the inside. Cargo would of course rather be the Vito, that is then the commercial version of this one, the V-Class always has the passenger focus. Now take a look at that. Those ones are the base 17 inch wheels. You get 18 and then also 19 and here we are. So those ones then are the 19 inch wheels. There you can see the difference. I think, I mean the 19 of course look pretty impressive, but I think to me the 17 one even is this special style look quite cool, don't they? What do you think? The rear has not been changed very much with the facelift. Well, what's interesting is here again, that was the base model with the normal tail lamps. And those ones here are the ones where all the LED in the front. And then you also get this more modern tail lamp scheme. This is also which looks visually different than here in the facelift.
especially if you order two <laughs> sliding doors. It's a really fun vehicle. Oh, this one here, eight-seater, six-seater, different seat options. I'll soon show you more about that, and you can climb all the way through all vehicles or next to this vehicle where Michelle is at the moment sitting. And all very interesting. Let's compare. Let's take a look at the interior. This one here is a that's a low spec variant and I really like to show this to you. In the front, by the way, soft touch here all over the place. Also good quality for the window levers. This one here with the black ins, but also with some gray stripes. You know, that looks actually quite modern. So they have changed in the face of those turbine vents. They are new and also those inlets, wood available, aluminum style and so on. We'll also show you some variation very soon. This one here also the steering wheel with some commands right there. Still the classic column for the ACC if you go for that one optional. And those ones are really good fabric seats. You see they're visually attractive with some white contrasts. And in this uh, um, you know seating part you feel it is quite rugged but also has a structure that it keeps a little bit cooler in summer. So I would definitely recommend you to pick those cool in summer and also not that cold in winter times and it's quite easy to get inside you have an upright seating position it's like suv alike but you know that's how a big van is also and that makes it very comfortable also in the long term run you have a good visibility to the front and since all the windows are very upright you also have a good visibility to the sides steering wheel can be controlled in height and reach with a very nice function then the instruments, you can see it right here, I can also power them up. Left side speed, right side RPM, and then you have the digital middle part where you can have the gear selection, visualization, but also the digital speed. It's not flickering in real life, by the way, should it be flickering in camera. Also some GPS information for the direction you're turning. It's not the newest fancy stuff, but it surely does the job. Interesting with the whole interior overview is you see those central lines and with the V-Class Mercedes have firstly introduced it with this generation with this very central layout in this very van segment. Interesting. But now with the facelift they have not updated this, the infotainment system. That's what I criticize most. Yes, you have those new turbine vents and also some new inlets right there and it still looks overall good here for the um, temperature change, for example, hotkeys for the GPS. Mm. It should be also a little bit better as for the processing quality when you really press it hard. But I think, you know, the main thing is really why haven't they put the MBUX infotainment system here, for example, for at least Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, but also with the voice image or so. But, you know, that has to be seen then for the next generation. They kept it with the infotainment system here. It's still a good map. You can still use your phone via, via Bluetooth, but that's about it then. I also want to show you the camera system. When you put in reverse gear, then you have the rear view camera. Plus, if you have that option, the 360 drone view from above. When you turn the steering wheel, you see also those helping lines show you where you're actually going to. And you can switch the view also to a full rear view camera where you see the sides. Interesting also that when you put in the 360 button left next to the steering wheel, then you see the front camera here. That's really helpful because you know, when you're not put in the reverse gear, but click the camera button, that might be a situation where you want to check, oh, what is in the front of me right there? And again, plus the fake drone view from above. Pretty helpful system, especially when you have like this, a little bit bigger car or a van. I don't know, do you share my opinion that a van needs a manual sliding door? It's just, I think it just belongs here that you can slide that like with you know you can really slam that and I just it's just fun I think of course the electric one is available then you can see how those fabric seats look in the rear different options available you have a bench that goes all the way through all those thinner seats here and also in the rear part this again is the shortest V class available here with a 222 so a six seater setup again or you can use two seating benches so quite flexible here of course in the shortest version you don't have any space in the rear than for the trunk left if you go with the all passenger setup but you could offer also for example use this one here for then four persons it's also very comfortable you sit upright here the seats are really well done 
headroom, no problem. I'm one means 86 or six foot one. Or I could take the shortest version here, still enough um, leg room. And for getting in the rear, flip the seat like this. Then you can also easily access it right there. And here we go. And see here with six adults, even no problem already here in this shortest version. Even have an electric window control here that you can just open it. It's not powered at the moment, but here you can I open it just you know slightly right there. Also in the latter part, very comfortable. Let's take a look at how much trunk space we have here in the compact version and see how that one changes when we go a little bit longer in length right there. Well, you cannot really say how much is there left in trunk, but as the seat setup is, as we've shown you, it's like this. Here we see it. Then you have this length left, but you can see you can change it all here on the rails, how the seats are being operated. So it really depends on. So this would be the minimum length you have left then. Another difference here, base model has just those rubber lips here above the doors. And then the higher trim levels have this chrome strip right there. Yeah, it looks a little bit fancier, but I think not the most important thing. And now interior with higher trim. Well, what are the differences? First of all, we have an Alcantara ceiling here. That's pretty nicely done, pretty fancy. We also have some animal skin seats here, but that's you know has nothing to do with the trim. It's just an option you don't have to go to. Then at the dashboard, we have an aluminum trim right there. That looks pretty clean, but you can switch the styles all the way around if you like. There's also an Artico dashboard. This is a leather red dashboard and a good example, you know, no one would know if it's fake or real leather. and You can just use the artificial one without animal harm. Looks pretty cool. And here we also have a big middle console. You can style it open like this. Two USB supplies. The USB supplies in the lower trim version were in the very bottom of the middle console. But then you didn't have this bulky part here. So you can also cool this part here, for example, for drinks or some snacks or something. You know, it's nice to have this additional storage. Here also, again, this one here can be heated or cooled for drinks. So inside just cooled, here heated and cooled. So it's cool to have, you know, some more possibilities right there. But on the other hand, on the low trim vehicle, it felt more open, more spacious, as this one wasn't that bulky. So, you know, I'm also a fan of useful cars, and especially in this van segment, I'm actually personally not such a fan of like this high trim 100,000 euro VIP shuttle version more like you know the one where people can also live in you know what I mean what do you think interesting here we also have a panoramic roof we have opened it at the moment so this would be another option there's also a separate climate control here for the rear seats take a look right here temperature and also the vent strength I can also close the panoramic roof again right here and I can also show you how you can easily slide those seats forward. So you release this lower end here and then here we go. So there's a massive difference then, um, for example, for getting in and out, that could also be helpful. And then you can see here, we also have a two, two, two setup, six seats. And then there's this table hidden right there. But at the moment as it is, it doesn't make too much sense. This table would rather make sense if you have just two more seats here in the back and then some room in the front, then you can easier fold out this table. Now the mid-size size or the so-called long version. Here we also have an option electric tailgate. Yeah, I mean, this is of course more practical than with the manual one. It's really a question of philosophy. Then this top part here can be lifted up, some foldable shopping baskets. Interesting idea. And you can put this split here up. You can also totally remove it. But in this way, you can, for example, load in the things right there. And you here in this longer version, you have at least 50 centimeters of luggage compartment. Or even if the seating row is in the backest or well, most backward positioned. So, but of course, longer than if you just slide the seats forward or maybe if you just use one seating row and so on. So it really always depends. But here the Main difference is that you can transport some serious luggage still, even if you're traveling with six or eight persons. And the third vehicle here with a mix of wood and this beige animal skin. Sadly, they do not offer the Artico full leatherette seats. 
because in the style, this one is, by the way, here the separate button, you, you can use this um, button right here. It's one way, or you can use this like this for the electric side doors. So different possibilities from the front, you can also control them as a shuttle driver or like this. So back to the seats. So I would like that they offer that in full article um, leatherette. That would be cool because the style is really nice and makes so much brightness in the interior also together with this bright ceiling. So I really like the styling here also in the interior. And this car you can see is also with three seats each. So that would be two, three, three. So overall then eight. Wow, I'm a math god, right? <laughs> so, and here's so there's the maximum passenger setup, and since this one is the extra long version, we still have even more luggage space. But when you drive this one, it's over with the feeling of driving a passenger car. That one then rather feels trucker like already, since this one here also has the longer wheelbase. So, longer wheelbase version, here we go, and even if we would have the seats in the most backward position, you can here see the increased length. So to the seated rails, it's about 75 centimeters, so 25 centimeters longer than from the interior trunk than the, let's say, mid version or the so-called long version. This one here, again, extra long. You can see that also this upper area here is yeah, almost 80 centimeters. So there you can have maximum people plus maximum luggage. But then again, you have to ask yourself, with this length of a vehicle, where can you still find a parking spot? Mercedes have updated the engines to the new emission standards. Those ones here are the diesels for Europe. So they have the SCR cleaning and meet the latest regulations. Two liter four cylinder diesel engine. And the same is also being used in the passenger cars either with 163 horsepower in the 220D, 190 horsepower in the 250D, or 239 horsepower in the new 300D, 500 newton meters of torque, and 7.9 seconds acceleration figure to 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour. And there's also a new 9G Tronic automatic gearbox, and the Vika is also available either with rear-wheel drive or also with all-wheel drive. So. Engine updates was very, very interesting when we drive the car now very soon. And they also promise less vibrations on the interior from the engine. Hmm. Let's see also about consumption and stuff. How does that one perform? And when you wonder about the US market, well, we've shown here the V-Class diesels here today. They are not available in the US because overall in Europe, we have the Vito as commercial variant and the V-Class as a top end high luxury passenger variant. In the US you have the Metris, which is this, just another name for the Vito. And the Metro is also more, let's say, the little bit rougher commercial van, which is available for cargo and for passenger transport, but it does not have the high-end luxury features that the V-Class is offering. The Metris is then also available with a two-liter four-cylinder petrol engine. get used to this chair here when doing reviews so it's pretty cool for me and a little bit more relaxed indeed so the front of the Mercedes Marco Polo it's basically the same as just for the front grille the same update here with the facelift this is how it looks indeed in the baseline if you would go for avant-garde or exclusive you would have some chrome contrast right there in the AMG line the diamond pin grille so that's the things you can pick those LED lamps now are also available and they have a little bit more modern shape. 
And also pretty nicely with this blue color that has a little bit brighter or darker nuance depending on how the light goes. The length here for the Marco Polo is always at 5 meters 14 or 202 inches. That is the middle length for the V-Class. Three lengths available, compact or normal, then long. This would what they call long and extra long. So, and they keep just this length because it's not too long. So you can still move around in the city, but you have some more length that you can actually fit up there with the bed and if they would do three different lengths also for the Marco Polo they would have to adjust the roof and so on and that wouldn't be easy that much so they really decided for this very length. There are also some AMG wheels here 19 inch 17 to 19 inch overall so this is not the AMG line but just the AMG wheels. Kevin's side blue is the color here by the way a really lovely one and you can see here we already put up the roof to see the full extension. And also on this side, you can see this is the supply for water and also external power. And quite good is also for your camping experience if you have those tire blocks right there that the car cannot roll away. In the rear, the Marco Polo is just different by this very Marco Polo batch. Other than that, since the V-Class facelift, also a little bit more modern tail lamp design. The Marco Polo gets all of the normal V-Class engines, a 2-liter 4-cylinder diesel, 163, 190 or 239 horsepower. The top spec, the 239 horsepower spec, would be the new 300D. That's the name, the strongest diesel engine for this one then. Once upon a time, there was a car review on the Mercedes Marco Polo, where Thomas was reading in a surf magazine, right in front of this front porch with the Marquis above him. <laughs> this is actually really part of the vehicle and can be just drawn back. It's uh, very interesting. Also interesting uh, setup here. Those table and chairs, all the set, can be stored in the back of the vehicle. I can soon also show you where. It's just, you know, this artificial grass. It's not part of the deal. But I think it's also a very interesting setup. Well, and I really have to say it's quite cozy sitting here. And then also have some sunshade depending on where the sun is coming from. It's really, I really feel like going somewhere with this vehicle. Let's take a look at the interior. Fabric would be base for the seats. This is the optional animal skin equipment. Does not really fit a thing to a you know, modern outdoor lifestyle, but they put it here because it looks also quite fancy. This table for the inside can also be folded out and in again. You can see this one is at the moment and the setup for you know, cooking, also have the, the noodles there with the tom tomato sauce. So this kitchenette is also part of the Marco Polo. So this is the standard deal. Also with the sink right there. 40, to be very correct, 38 liters is the tank for the fresh water and 40 liters then for the used water. I'll also soon show you on the outside where it's actually rinsing out. Well, you can cook your coffee or your some onions in here <laughs> nice sample well and of course this can all be closed here like put it back and then close it again for the driving so it's a very clean solution and you might ask yourself what is the main purpose of this vehicle because well there's no toilet in here so it's not to say like a full camper this is something in between you know between the normal car and the full camper van so here, for example, if you, you know, have like a camping place where you do have toilets and showers and so on, although a shower would be possible here, I can show you that in the back. But here the advantage is that you're still quite flexible, you know, you can drive around quite easily and also maybe inside cities and so on. So it always depends on where and how you start your holidays. This roof that can be folded up is also quite handy. First of all, I can stand up here with 1, one meters 86 or 6 foot 1. Still have some uh, some air above me and this here can be closed, this shade. It's also then a window that can be opened right there. Actually all the way electrically. Yeah, I'm using this finger now, yeah? It's more polite to you. <laughs> so, I'm back again. It's also interesting for sleeping, of course. And you also have those side windows then here for sleeping. Those are basically fabric windows. 
this is the bed above us now. We can soon fold that down. So it's pretty cool in here. You can see you can slide those seats around. We can also put them around once more. But this would be a cozy situation where, you know, with actually four adults in here or maybe with some kids and then have a nice chat around here. Even if the weather is bad and if the weather is good, you can just take a seat again on the outside. You also have a fridge, by the way, there it is, with some reasonable storage in there, indeed. And, of course, some normal storage, for example, here, this is a sliding door for, you know, let's say, all the cutlery you might need, for example, here again, some storage for wipers or whatever, and also on the top part here, and you can see, you can still open it, although the table is installed. This, for example, here, the, the one for the cutlery so very nicely done also for this demonstration all set already here we go and you see they actually secure it's really a soft close here there we go and it's also secured then again for driving also very interesting you know power supply usb and then here also a base boost maybe when you're having a party right in here to fold the seats around by the way turn it around right there need some more power here we go there we go and then we are back in the driving position and now let's build some so we can fold in the table right here and then this bench that also goes forward like this and you can actually really do that with one hand it's no problem you might also see that the head restraints are missing here. They're just mounted at the back side. So and there's also a reason for that because here we can actually electrically flip back the seats like this. Because you know there's a bed above us, but there's also a bed right here where I'm at the moment. So it takes a while, takes a while, and the head restraints are also properly stored. Here we go. Well, slide a little bit more forward, maybe just a little. There we go. And then it should be done, actually. Hmm. This is live on tape. Now the motor should actually be stopping. Not sure what the compressor is doing there. Hmm, that's not good. There we go. So, again, auto fuel life on tape. No marketing BS. So, then, this one here, is, by the way, is a securing net for the children when they sleep up. It might be important for parents. But doesn't play a big role here for us at the moment. So, this one here, this is already quite soft. You can make it softer a little bit. You can adjust, actually, the softness. Again, also right here. So here with those buttons, you make it stiffer or softer. And you can see it really fits. Um, I'm not sure. Actually, I think it would be better because this part here would be harder if you, um, you know, just fold yourself around like this. And you see, this is actually, an, again, two adults full size. And it's actually quite comfortable, but it's, of course, better when you put a small mattress here on top of that and then you have actually a spot for four adults to sleep in this vehicle the upper part will show you very soon so michelle behind the camera he was just telling me what kind of a lazy review is that you're sitting on chairs all day you're just laying around here in the bed and so on well but i'm showing you a lot of things <laughs> so here we go this one here would be the spot where you store the chairs and the table from the outside, you know, the table on the inside can be stored as I've shown you. This one here for the outside chairs and table, quite good. And then you can still put some luggage, of course. Oh, you have to go all the way up and then, huh? yeah, I just don't want to squish Michelle right there. And then you have a cupboard right here. This is one side of it. Then there's also another side. So it's basically split. Maybe, you know, if you split in two people, split it for two people. <laughs> So here we go. And there's also a mirror. And then you can see maybe through the mirror that you have even more storage right there. This would be primarily for clothes, I think. Covered again from this perspective. You can see it's actually quite large. And 
another one is right here that has also some additional storage, for example, then here for the towels. If you want the upper bed to unfold, here we go. So you have to release that, of course, also while driving, because then the roof would be down. And the same thing you do on the other side. And then you can just leave that one down and have, again, full-size bed on top. So at the moment they got the pillow right there at the lower end side, but I think I would just prefer sleeping like this because the sun is just coming in here through the windows. That's really nice. And also when you look at the side, at those beige fabric sides here, left and right, this is so nice again because when the sunlight is just, you know, shining through this, it makes a warm light atmosphere right here. And again, this one would be the full fabric window if you want some more fresh air and i got here by the way via the front seats so if you just take off your shoes and then step on the front seats that's no problem to get up here then and for nighttime you also have some led lights available here they're not flickering for your human eye by the way you can also dim them a little bit so that it doesn't get too dark in here when you have maybe a longer night party or so Let's get inside here. This comes a little bit later for the Marco Polo as usual because it was rather about the rear experience. Here, upright seating position, also like a normal Mercedes V-Class. Build quality is really good. Also soft touch here at the top of the dashboard. Here we also have a dark wood veneer. There are different ones available. Aluminum, black piano lacquer. And like also this wood style, there's also matte wood style available, turbine vents. Those ones are new with the facelift, so not so much has been done with the facelift, but those turbine style vents, they are one of the news. For the infotainment system, you use this jog, again, press and turn, because this infotainment system here is still no touch. It has not been updated. This is, I think, the biggest disappointment of this facelift. They haven't done, well, they've done something to the engines, a little bit of styling here and there, but they should have changed the infotainment system that it also features Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. It does not feature that one, so phone connection still, we have Bluetooth, and here in the map, it's, you know, it's a good visualization still, but a little bit outdated, also with this big frame here around. You can do the most stuff you need with that one, but no voice control whatsoever, so not equipped with the new MBUX. Instruments rather classical, left side speed, right side RPMs in the middle part. You have a digital screen, it's not flickering in real life by the way. Here you can for example see some um, consumption info, but also some you know telephone info who you want to call for example. Ghostbusters. So in the lower part for the independent heating control that looks a little bit old school. But here you also have two USB supplies and another 12 volt power supply next to some adaptive cup holders for traveling. And before driving the Marco Polo, let me show you how it looks like cleaned up. This is everything ready for driving, also with head restraints, all the stuff closed and everything cleaned up, nothing flying around. So this would be how you ideally would drive the vehicle. And here in this vehicle, we also have another cover right here. This is also very beautiful. It's a carbon fiber style. It's not carbon fiber, but it surely looks very sporty. And in this lower unit, you can Control the independent heating and also pre-time it. You can change the temperature up to minus 16 degrees for the freezer. And then this one here is the function for the roof. If you have the electric one, and then you can press it here for open. So here the electric version. If you have a manual roof, then there would be some clamps right here. You can open and then just push it upwards. But now the electric one. Now driving the Mercedes Marco Polo with the new 300D and the big question is of course is it any different from a, no yeah. <laughs> from a normal Mercedes V-Class uh, v driving the Marco Polo here. You have about 
220 something kilograms more of weight, mainly due to the kitchen and of course the roof construction and so on. But to really feel the weight difference, I mean, it's just put three more people uh, in a car. Would you say you feel the difference? In a very small car, which has a very low power, you would feel in the acceleration. But do you feel in the driving dynamics then? Hmm. If you're not a racer, not on the racetrack, that's a tough question. Maybe if you directly drive the cars after each other. Other than that, the good thing of the Marco Polo is that it really drives just like a normal V-Class in, you know, in, in general. This one here then, since the Marco Polo only has one length, it's also the mid-length of the V-Class. So the one they call large, again, compact large, extra large, or Mercedes defines it. And this one is still something as a compromise. So the extra large version is really long. You have the longer wheelbase and it rather feels a little bit truck alike already or sprinter alike. And this one here is not too different from the shortest V-Class version because it has the same wheelbase. So what is different when driving the Marco Polo then? Well, you have this fabric from the roof construction and when you're going over some uneven roads, I'm not sure if you can pick that up on camera yourself, but this fabric there, which is folded, you can hear it moving around just a little bit when you're at uneven roads or here when something is shaking. It's like, like a little bit like, you know, when you do something like this here with your finger, it's like coming from the upper party from the fabric because, you know, it's folded and then there's some friction, just a little bit. It's where when you really pay attention, then you hear that. So that could be maybe a little bit annoying if you compare it to driving just the normal V-Class. That's at lower speeds. At higher speeds, other vibrations and noises will maybe um, even that out. With the 300D, the top diesel here, you can drive actually a little bit calmer because you don't have to push the throttle that much. You have abundance of power even if the car is on a heavy load so that's actually quite good and also indeed there are less vibrations from the engine as they promised it feels indeed quite passenger car like just when you're at lower speeds and really listen to the engine noise it you know sounds a little bit different than in the passenger car although it is the same engine maybe because i'm not sure the, the front uh, hood there is maybe a little bit closer to you i don't know but here driving a little faster and now there's no difference so this diesel in it feels also quite refined the steering is soft and easy and you do have some good reaction it's of course not tuned on a very sporty note but it doesn't have to be so it feels actually quite natural you have a good overview to the front and also the suspension there are different suspensions available normal one they call it comfort. Then there's a sportier suspension. I'm not sure why we would go for that one with the V-Class or Marco Polo. And then there's also an adaptive suspension. And when you have that one, we also have that one here. And you can also change some driving modes here. And for example, the automatic also is switching up the gears. So when you're in sport mode, the gears are turned a little bit more and you have a little bit better acceleration. Consumption will be just a little bit higher than with the normal Mercedes V-Class, but that's the same also as you would put the load on it. So the facelift, driving-wise, mainly changes the engine, feels a little bit more refined. Consumption will still not be that low. Um, so maybe a little bit less than before, but I wouldn't really count on that such a heavy vehicle has a low consumption. Um, We'll drive a little bit longer also and then keep you updated with that one at a later stage. At the moment we're here at about 12 liters for some city driving and we can also go a little bit on the motorway, reset the consumption meter and see what would be the minimum consumption value. So if we set the cruise control on the motorway that's always a good test to see what's possible on the lowest scale. So overall, also good driving feeling here from the Marco Polo, 
But indeed, the thing um, there is a little bit to criticize that there is some more noise definitely coming from this uh, fabric folding of the roof. So, I mean, I think you can still live with that, but it's something you definitely notice. Now we go to the motorway, set the ACC, the adaptive cruise control. That's a very reliable system. And we also feel that at 100 kilometers or 60 miles an hour, it's reasonable silent in here as for the noise insulation. And you don't have that with all vans. So especially for a van, this is really a very good noise insulation. And we can also see that you can bring the consumption to about nine liters on 100 kilometers if you go cruise control and motorway. Thomas is driving lounge with the V-Class facelift and in general about the V-Class, it's really the case that it rather drives like a passenger car. So we have a very light steering, you don't have to steer that much, but the steering feels quite natural. The sound insulation is really very well done, so it's quite silent in here. I think you can also pick it up on camera. Also this diesel, they have worked that it's a little bit more silent, also it's, uh, you know, transport less vibrations into the cabin. I mean, you feel someone it's diesel, but especially here in this new 300D horsepower spec, 239 horsepower. It's actually quite powerful and you don't have so much lag when you get on the throttle and have need to wait until the turbo sets in and so on. So it's actually a quite refined ride. So that's quite good. Also when you go in some slalom, you have a good control of the vehicle. It does not shake up too much. You can also go into um, a sport mode that turns up the gears a little bit higher. The suspension is actually very comfortable. You know, it's a very good compromise that you can move the car around even in, let's say, some sporty way. But still, also the bumps, or if you go over some, some speed humps and so on, they are even out very, very well. The overview is nice to all of the side, actually. That's just the building form of the vehicle. By the way, also a great turning circle. You sit so much well, you know, on the front axle and there's not not a long hood, so sometimes you try to turn around somewhere and you say, oh, did that really work? That's quite astonishing. This one here, the short wheelbase model, so the shortest version and the middle <laughs> version, yeah, base, basically have the same wheelbase and then the extra long, that one has the longer wheelbase. That is then different to drive to the two smaller ones, not such a big difference. We'll soon also go a little bit faster and tell you more about the sound insulation. So far again, you know, the diesel indeed a little bit more refined and they use the same diesel in the passenger cars. That's also again, you know, part of their strategy to make the vans more passenger alike. They also recently, from the business perspective, sales perspective, moved the van segment from Mercedes from the commercial brand to the passenger brand. So that's again telling you something about the commitment in this case. And I think I can understand it. If you buying this for you know leisure or also for passenger transport, you want it to feel less commercial vehicle like. And I think indeed they could achieve that. It was not that much the case with the Mercedes X class. This was also the just the base taken there from the from the Nissan pickup. But here with the V-Class, it really works very well that it does feel like a passenger car. Of course, there is some significant length still behind, so you have to pay attention. You don't take corners too close, but it's not like with a truck where you have to um, you know, go in a very, very wide, uh, wide radius. It's still quite okay. So if you're jumping in that one here from a normal passenger car, you don't need to get used to it that much. That's still totally okay. Now, let's see, get on the motorway and then we'll accelerate it out just a little bit and then I'll also reset the consumption meter again. Mm, I can tell you, from this size, from this weight, 
cannot expect any low consumption figures. So um, our average consumption, which we usually measure here with the V-Class, is definitely in a two-digit liter figures. Only when you reset the consumption meter, then you can get lower and do that quite soon. Here also, when you're going up the motorway, it's a good performance from, the th uh, from this new 300D engine. Don't be mistaken, it's not a three liter diesel that doesn't fit in that small front engine cabin right there. But it has still some significant power. I mean, if you think about less than eight seconds to 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour, that's quite decent for this van here. Mostly, of course, when you think about that you have probably a heavy load or driving with a lot of people, and you can still punch it then a little bit more on the motorway. What does the facelift do in the driving? Well, it's more about this new engine and it's a little bit more refined and with less vibrations. That's the main thing about the facelift. The other thing doesn't change too much in the driving perspective. You know, over the years they fix some small things maybe here and there, some tweaks. So uh, sometimes it's also good to wait a little bit until the car gets a little bit older, so not buy it directly from the launch, but buy it a little, couple of years later, the, this generation, because there may be even out some, some problems that might have been occurring. So now we can drive about 90 kilometers an hour, so like 55 miles, and you also hear how excited it's still here in that vehicle. That's pretty cool, also with the cruise control, works with a separate column, easy to set, and the distance is kept to the car in front of us. And that's also the same as in a passenger version. You are a little bit more prone to side wind effects, yes, but you also have the side wind assist from stand equipment. And how does it work? It works over the ESP, the Electronic Stability Program. And so if there is heavy side wind, the car could actually regulate something via the brakes, if that's really necessary. Um, in most cases you will just hold on tight to the steering wheel, but I mean it's definitely good to have it just in case. Oh, well, let's set the ACC away once more again, because then I can see I'm um, keeping my foot off the brake uh, and also off the throttle at the moment. So here the distance is being kept and that system here, the Distronic, is working very well like that. There's also the blind spot monitor for those side mirrors. At the moment no one is overtaking us but there will be then a triangle, a small tri triangle flashing. It's also good to have that here in this van segment. Other than that, as I said, you also have a normal good overview. And of course also a nice camera system optional. Not only a normal rear cap camera, you can also get this 360 degree view from above. Also at higher speeds, the car remains relatively stable. It's really, yeah, actually it's, it's quite fun to drive the car. And the big question is always, Thomas, which one is now the better one, V-Class or the Volkswagen T6? It's a good question. So both have their fan base and certain reason to go for this or that. They here, of course, have a little bit more sensual interior. The T6 has also been facelifted recently. Infotainment-wise, the T6 is now leading it. Also has some, you know, even interesting uh, systems as for the systems right there. Hmm, it's really a tough question. So I feel the noise insulation is a little bit better in the V-Class here. This also accounts for this passenger driving feeling. So when you ask myself, you want that normal car feeling, then the V-Class is closer to it than the T6. The T6 then has other advantages. It's, um, I have sometimes the feeling it's a little bit more roomy on the interior. And also is you know, not a good drive. So yeah, you can argue pro and con. The V-Class, depending on the configuration, is uh, quite often also a little bit more expensive, but that's I'm criticizing about both. Yes, they are both leading the segment. They are very refined and like 
almost luxurious cars, but they are so, so extremely expensive both when you spec something in it. And I think about some families who might really need the space and want to get that vehicle and wow, how much money they would have to spend to get a decent T6 or a decent V-Class, that really hurts. So now on this countryside road, let's reset the consumption meter and see what that one delivers. So far at about average consumption about 10 liters on 100 kilometers. So yeah, I mean, or you can say some 23, 24 MPG US, some about some 30 MPG UK. I mean, consider the segment we are in. But of course, we can always hope for lower consumption. It really depends on how much you hit the throttle. And um, I wouldn't have to test it on a very, very long term run to see what it's really about. But good thing really about the 300D here is that you can be a little bit more gently with the throttle. Mm, does it really make sense to pay a super extra price for the 300D? I mean, you're not racing with this car anyway, so if you get a lower, way lower entry price at your dealer when you stick with the smaller horsepower figure for that engine, you're also totally fine off by that. So now on those corners, I really have to say it's actually quite fun. And again, back to the comparison with the T6, I feel the V-Class is sitting a little bit lower on the road than the T6. Again, this accounts for this passenger car feeling. And when you are in those winding corners, I feel that the V-Class feels a little bit more at home doing that than with the T6. T6 is to me feels that it would be sitting a little bit higher. Again, this is also you know about pro and con. Well, and Mercedes have promised us a lot of performance also from this engine, so I would say. We search for a spot to rev it up a little bit more. Also go then in the sports mode to see what it really can deliver. Here again in this roundabout, the agility can be tested very well and again, the car surprises me that it's really very well to drive. I think about the sound, I mean you, you hear it's a diesel but I think it's not too annoying at all. We're going downhill. Let's drive it a little bit sporty. I think it's also nice in this countryside close to Sitges, where you can see through our panoramic camera. Now we're a little bit straight, no one is behind us. Let's go to the sports mode and let's accelerate just like from, from 20 on, 20 kilometers, and let's go. That was already 80 kilometers an hour. So, quite decent. This one is the rear wheel drive model. There is also an all wheel drive available. Mm. Estimation is that this will top up the consumption about 0.5 liters on one kilometers. All wheel drive always boosts the consumption a little bit, depending on the car, more or less. The all wheel drive would be making sense if you have some plans for winter trips with the vehicle and maybe snowy conditions or some semi off-road stuff. Of course, always nice to have the all-wheel drive, but it's not really necessary since this one is rear-wheel driven, not a super performance car and you have a lot of weight of both axles, you will also still have a lot of traction just via the rear axle. So, generally well done. This diesel upgrade does bring you more power, yes, makes sense. And again, price will also go higher. So the question is, is it just not, you know, is it just okay for you when you go with the lower horsepower spec? Because the base engine, also displacement and so on, will also remain the same. Yeah, and you know about the consumption, mm, yeah, quite again, again, like about 11, 12 liters. So, uh, can score a single digit figure like you know what some some nine liters one kilometers when you really reset it on the motorway and have cruise control set and it's even um, a straight road 
but that's not a realistic figure than when in, you know when you're driving every day in the city and so on in the mix. Still, really enjoyed driving the V-Class here. I hope you did too. And now to our conclusion for today with the Mercedes V-Class in the recent facelift. Well, the facelift did not change too much. A little bit on the front, a little bit on the interior as for the styling. Important are the new diesels that they're all on the newest regulation standard. Consumption-wise, you know, I would have liked to see a little bit more improvement. However, the power improvement is quite significant for the 300D especially if you were driving for example with heavy load or with a lot of passengers all the time and want to be a little bit faster on the motorway for example the key thing about the v-class in general is that it's really passenger car like it drives really silently good noise insulation the handling is actually quite good it's still fun to drive this vehicle and from noise insulation and you know driving agility i think also a little bit better than the volkswagen t6 whereas this one recently had a face of with a better infotainment system for example so both surely have their pros and cons yeah here they lacked to update the infotainment system that's probably the biggest disappointment with the facelift here other than that we've shown you different versions i really like the fabric seats and the more base version of the v-class then you can also keep the price a little bit lower and still have a very interesting and flexible vehicle with the luxury VIP package, everything, then it gets super, super expensive. So, yes, I mean, together with the T6, top of the segment, but also price-wise, top of the segment. That's the catch for that. So, what do you think about the V-Class facelift? And to the conclusion for the Mercedes Marco Polo. It profits from the general V-Class updates from the facelift. Well, there are not so many updates, to be honest. More like a model year change. The assistance systems have been upgraded as well. This is maybe something that's an active brake assist, optional with the ACC. Side wind assist is, by the way, standard. You know, some new design lines. It looks a little bit more fresher in the exterior and also when you want the AMG style. That is possible now if you want some sporty style. Well, the uh, vegetable barbecue is also uh, starting next to me. So if you see some smoke going over here, no, we're not smoking weed. But it would fit a little bit to the setup, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, and rest of the Marco Polo, of course, pretty impressive on the interior. That you have a high luxury without a toilet. You know, that's the thing. So a big camper would, of course, have a toilet. That's the thing. And yeah, I mean, the price for that is still quite high. So normal V-Class, about 40,000 euros if you take German prices. Then a V-Class Marco Polo activity. That's the, you know, the base spec about 50,000 also that around for the so-called Horizon. The Horizon Marco Polo is just with the roof. So the Marco Polo always has this top roof which you can put up. But however, the normal Marco Polo without any additional name also includes the kitchen. So if you go for the Horizon, well, it's really starting to smoke here now. So if you go for the Horizon, you would have the roof, but not the kitchen. As it stands here right now, at least 60,000 with all the kitchen and stuff. And when you put some more extras, you can easily reach 70,000 and even more. That's then again the downs of this vehicle. So much cool stuff we've seen on the interior. It's really, really expensive. What do you think? Also leave me your comments right there to the Marco Polo. <laughs>